greatest person you've ever met. It could be great in any meaning of that word, right? You would consider someone great. Who's the greatest person you've ever met? Physically met. You've personally met, yeah? Not many people understand the greatness of this one, but Brian Noble, who managed the Leeds Rhino yeah, team yeah. and is now managing a part of the British system, um, managed these Rhinos from being at the bottom, from a very murky bottom oh, table yes. position, to being championship and I mean winners for the whole time he was there, about one year. So I thought, he, and he was, he is the, one of the most normal people in that apart from Danny. And he is very down to earth, very, just very normal. He talked about his kids, he talked about his family. But he clearly got a certain attitude and charisma that the, the players just latched onto, the club latched onto. It was so you met him? Yeah. He was, he, you could see why people loved him, but it was because he was normal. Right, no. And so his character. I, I would consider him to be very great for what he accomplished and yeah. his character. And his character. So his achievements and his character. Yeah. Brian Noble, yes, I've heard him speak. He's an interesting guy. Lee Frino's a rugby, uh, rugby lead. Sorry. Leads well, rugby league. Yes. There you go. You're, we're learning a lot of things here. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, anybody else? Who, who you met you said considered to be great? I met Tim, Sir Tim Berners Lee. No. The inventor of the internet, internet and everything. Yeah. You met him. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Um, the most impactful person I met was the headmaster of school in Afghanistan. Mm. Um, when I built the, the first school there for boys and girls. Um, he picked up that school and um, he was sad. Um, his house was burned down, his family was beaten up. Um, and he came to uh, the home office there to meet me because they were told to the fundraisers out there and to thank us for all the work that we're doing. And this man who was about six foot six and a weathered face that looked like he'd been around for 200 years was, he was there thanking me and I'm in awe just of what he's doing with his life and just the same he's done. Wow, that, that sounds like greatness to me. Yeah. My goodness me. That's commitment to education, to, to, to stab, but I will. Uh, anybody else want to try and follow that? Um, yes, I'm, an, I'm an educational team, Malcolm. Uh, I think Graham Hill, the former racing, British racing mm -hmm. champion, who came to present the prizes when I was at the school that you attended. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, he gave a wonderful extemporary talk about his life, which had not been that easy. Uh, and then we he presented the prizes, and then we finished, and we all went off to have some refreshments. And uh, I was looking for him, and couldn't find him. And I went back in the hall, and he was sitting on the edge of the stage, signing the books of all the boys who had the prizes. So for those of you not the correct generation, so Graham Hill was Damon Hill's father. Mm -hmm. that gen yes, so. yeah. yes, I have his autograph from that. I was there. Yes, that's right. And I have his autograph. Yeah. Yes, he's a really, really lovely guy. That was so famous and, and everything. Yeah. Great people. One last one, if someone wants to. Pen? No? Oh, Charlotte? Yeah, that's good. Sorry, or Jeannie? Ladies first. A lady called Sandra Jones, <coughs> when I was living in Zimbabwe. She had been very badly abused as a child, unable to have any children herself as a result, and adopted and fostered many children. And then she went on to establish um, a group called Kids Can. And she went around every school in Zimbabwe, explaining to children what they could do if they were in that situation. She then began to suffer from cancer. Um, she died several years later, but during that time she had established her own uh, home in Bulawayo, which today is still funded from all around the world. She was the most amazing lady, often in severe pain, but her great concern was the children who were being abused. Wow. Really Thank you. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. It's interesting here in the contrasting kinds of people we're talking about here. Some majority, if you talked about those people with uh, a stranger on the street, they'd say, oh yeah, that was a great person. And then others we're talking about would be more under the radar. Greatness isn't about necessarily how well known you are. It's something else, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I did meet Eric Cantona 
um, many years ago when in Manchester, Fred, my son, and I went to buy a metronome from a music shop in Manchester, and who should we see in there? Uh, trying out trumpets and bugles because he played the uh, he plays brass instruments, and um, and he was trying it. There was a couple of friends trying those instruments, so Fred and I bought our metronome and then we waited outside until he came out <laughs> in his minders. And uh, I said, "Excuse me, Eric, uh, would you like to come to church?" And uh, he pretended not to understand, he not speak any English. And uh, but uh, anyway, we had a little brief chat and or sort of, and off he went. Uh, of course, you may know that Zlatan has been signed by Man U, and he said he's going to come and be the king of Manchester. Well, Eric says he's already the king, and said that Zlatan could be the prince if he likes. And apparently Zlatan is not content with that. He said, I want to be the god of Manchester. So, I, I don't, I don't, but he's going to get perhaps tasted. Uh, we'll see. Um, um, the greatness, the interesting thing. Um, Let's read that passage and think about greatness. Okay, we're in Luke 11, so we continue our study of the Gospel of Luke, and we're in Luke 11, verse 29, a short passage, just verses 29 down to verse 32. Luke 11, verse 29. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man uh, uh, be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Twice Jesus says, and now something greater is here, clearly referring to himself and the message that he's, he's bringing. The people around him didn't generally uh, respond very well to this. I mean, imagine if someone that you thought was great, so you think of, uh, who, who have we mentioned here, um, so Tim Bern Berners-Lee, is that name? Berners-Lee, all right, so imagine someone that came along and said, I'm greater than Tim Berners-Lee. Or someone comes along and says, I'm greater than the headmaster in Afghanistan. You, you might be offended by that if you think they are that person is particularly great. And this is just some person who are they, just come out of nowhere. And then Jesus provoke, provokes this kind of reaction to the people around him who don't recognize his true greatness. And I think that's the question for us and the whole of humankind today. Do we truly recognize the greatness of Jesus? That he was the greatest, not a great person, not a great teacher, but the greatest. In this passage, he's comparing himself to Solomon and the King of the South and Jonah and the Ninevites in, in, in explaining this to the people around him. We're going to dig into this a little bit and talk about it because I think it'll help us to understand, even though, even though the point isn't about Jonah and Solomon, we need to learn a bit about it to understand why Jesus is saying what he's saying. So, Second, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 9, King Solomon, who was he? He was greater, greater, I want it again, greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. All the kings of the, <coughs> me, all the, kings of the earth sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put on his heart. So the emphasis here is on wisdom, even though riches is, is a part of the package, but wisdom great man. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, we have in the Bible. He wrote a number of Psalms we have in the Bible. He wrote many, if not most, of the Proverbs we have in the Bible. People still use those as wisdom to guide their lives, both if they believe in God and sometimes even if they don't, because there's great wisdom contained within them. So, who was Solomon? Did he really live? Now, this is not so clear, I know, for you here, but you have it on your handouts and it's on, online as well. I just want to show you something a little bit here. So we have Solomon. We have Solomon off the chart because this needs to go down ever so slightly further. Right. So, right. so there he is, Solomon, reading the ingredients on your handout. So there he is, at this point in history, um, around, where are we? 940, 950, uh, uh, 
before Christ. So in that period, there he is. That's his time. Uh, do we know much about him outside of the Bible? Not a great deal. There aren't many bi biblical sources outside the Bible for, for Solomon. But his dad, there is an interesting thing people have questioned for centuries where the King David really existed because of the lack of archaeological evidence that he existed, except that we have a record in the Bible, but not in archaeology. But not that long ago, this was dug up, that was called the Tel Dan inscription. 9th century stone stealing is to be a, 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 a column, and it commemorates the victory of an Aramean king over two southern neighbors, the king of Israel. So remember that Israel was divided into the northern and the southern kingdoms, the king of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. He had a victory over the king of Israel and, in the south, the king of the house of David. That's not David himself, he's talking about David's dynasty. In other words, there was a King David, or else it wouldn't make sense to have the house of David. And so we now have archaeological evidence that uh, King David did exist, which is rather nice to know. And the more digging, I think the more they'll find. That's generally the way it goes, right? So uh, Solomon, what did he do? He built a big temple. His dad wasn't allowed to by God, but uh, Solomon built it. It looked something like that. That's not the temple Jesus would have known. That was Herod's temple, the second temple, this was the first temple, something like that. Same site as the now Temple of Mount in Jerusalem, something like that. The Queen of the South came to visit him, or the Queen of Sheba, as well mentioned here in 1 Kings 10. When the Queen of Sheba saw the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers and burnt offerings, he made the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. When you're a queen, I guess it must take quite a lot to get overwhelmed. When you're already a queen, what could overwhelm you? But her visit to Solomon overwhelmed her. She came from a wealthy kingdom. Uh, there is evidence of that kingdom in Saturn Sheba. I'll show you a map in a moment. Um, there's evidence of it. The Assyrians, who lived a little bit later, have records we found in archaeology of queens ruling Sheba or Saba in Southwest Arabia, now modern Yemen. And uh, there were priest kings and, pre and, and queens in that period down there. So, where did she come from? She came from roughly this area here in modern day Yemen. There's Sheba. Uh, she went up to Jerusalem to see him. That's a straight line. The straight line is uh, 1,300 miles, it's uh, uh, 2,137 kilometers. If you go in by car on modern roads, it'll, it's about 1,800 miles, so it's not exactly around the corner. If you were walking, the walking route, which takes you more sort of inland and back out again in this way, uh, that's about 2,584 miles. Uh, she was not driving the car. And she was probably not walking, probably on a camel, but that would have probably gone at walking pace because she'd have had servants who were walking. So uh, walking pace, roughly 20 miles a day. That route will take 129 days to get from Sheba up to Jerusalem and another 129 back. Assuming that she stayed in Jerusalem for about a month or so, which is likely, that's at least nine months. Factor in the odd bit of bad weather and illness, she was away from her kingdom for a year. Now think about what it must have taken to get her to leave her kingdom and her palace and all of her people for a year just to go and see some king in Jerusalem and listen to his wisdom. You can have some pretty amazing wisdom for someone to, to do that. It's a significant risk. Bandits on the route. Uh, the possibility of a coup back home while you're gone. Uh, all, all kinds of problems. So this is, this is the situation that Jesus is alluding to here with the Queen of Sheba. Someone who was willing to go to that length to find out some wisdom. And yet Jesus is saying... You know Solomon, you know that guy who was so wealthy and built the temple and all that wisdom and the queen went, you know, we have all the writings. I am related. So, I'd like to take a pause for a moment in the sermon here and talk to your neighbor. What, in what way is Jesus greater than Solomon? Quick fire answers. In what way is Jesus greater than Solomon? Yeah? He was wiser. He was wiser. Okay. He was actually the source of wisdom, whereas... Solomon received wisdom. Particularly, that's it. He received that wisdom from God through prayer, but Jesus was walking embodiment of, he was the source of wisdom. Excellent, thank you. With all his wisdom, Solomon did some foolish things. Yeah. <laughs> he also uh, 
Jesus didn't use his wisdom for any selfish purposes, but Solomon compromised by moral choices in life, yes. Solomon's was temporary, Jesus' kingdom is eternal. Okay. Uh, yeah. Solomon died, but Jesus still living. Okay, so did we have a resurrection come but we'll come to the resurrection in a minute, actually. That's very relevant. Okay, good. Anything else? Miracles. Miracles. Solomon didn't do any miracles. No, Jesus did a lot. Yeah, anything else? Jesus coming from the world had the whole visibility of what that is, what that is, and what God is. And Solomon only had information. <coughs> he had a glimpse, he had a, a, a little bit of a hint, but not much more than that. Jesus absolutely had yeah, a lot. Solomon on earth had a lot of power, but then when it comes down to in a whole, Jesus had so much power. Yeah. Well, uh, that's a very profound thought that the power is very different. And the appearance of the power and the use of the power. No one? Jesus took no, no risks with his own well-being. Jesus was prepared to die for us. Jesus didn't know where he was going to lay his head, and he died for us. we got a lot more, I'm sure, but we'll move on for now. But isn't it, isn't it interesting how, how is there a chance I talk with you on that? Oh, no, that's great. Thanks. Um, isn't it interesting that we don't, it doesn't take us long to figure this out and think about this, but the people who were listening to Jesus at that point were like, Solomon, great, you would know, why should we pay any attention to what you're saying? There's a bit of a disconnect there. Let's talk, let's go on and talk about a few more things here. Um, we'll move on to Jonah in just a second, but I might suggest that this verse, well these verses which are familiar to many of us, might be very important to reflect on. Jesus had the wisdom about salvation, but Solomon did not. I'd say that might be the key difference between the two. As for you, Paul writes in Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you know the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. If you need to be wise unto anything, Surely it's to salvation. The scriptures can make you wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Solomon gives us partial wisdom. Jesus gives us full wisdom. Solomon points to God. Jesus is walking, is God in the flesh, and Solomon had no power to offer salvation. Jesus' words do offer and provide salvation, make us wise to salvation through faith in Him. Very different uh, situation. Let's talk about Jonah a little bit, and then we'll draw some conclusions. Right, another timeline. Jonah, where is he? There he is, his green little thing here. Jonah's a little bit later. Here he is in here. Uh, around the, the change between the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the later Assyrian Empire, where are we? I can't even read that myself. What's that number up there? 700, 700 something uh, before Christ. So that's where he is now there. He's in Judah, the, the southern kingdom. A bit of a comic figure, you might say. A runaway prophet, a problem passenger, uh, who caused uh, a fish great indigestion, um, and became very cross over just a small little withered plant that God had given him. Uh, we have uh, evidence of that empire that he spoke to when preached to Nineveh. Uh, this is your map on your handout. So we have uh, we have him going from here. Joppa, there's Jerusalem. His job are right on the coast. Doesn't show up so well on there. He was going this way. Uh, Tarsus, where he was off to, was probably in southern Spain. There is a name of a place that's been unearthed with a very similar name. But he's going this way, whereas God told him to go that way. There's <laughs> Nineveh. So you couldn't get much more opposite. And then it was still a long way away, but he wanted to go the opposite uh, direction. Uh, we know a lot about that, em that empire, the Assyrian Empire of that time. As one example, this is in the British Museum, if you haven't seen it, it's well worth a visit. This is the Black Obelisk of Shadow Manasseh III. Um, and this is something celebrating his military uh, victories. He was a, a king of Assyria. And uh, this is the, this is about this tall, I suppose. And these panels record his victories, and this is a blow-up of that particular bit. And this is King Jehu kneeling before Shalmaneser III offering tribute. King Jehu was one of the Jews, uh, 
uh, the kings of Judah. Um, so you can find out more about that. There's a, a, a connection to that picture and the information from the link which is on your uh, handouts. Uh, also recorded on the same obelisk are references to Ben Hadad and Hazael, who are biblical figures. So it's great when we see some archaeology from another culture using names and confirming things that we have in the Bible, which happens uh, a lot and, and happens more and more as time is going by. One last thing. Here is the mosque at um, uh, Mosul. You'll have heard of Mosul. It's in, in Iraq. In, in mentioned it because of the war there. Mosul is the same site as Nineveh. That's, that's just the modern name for Nineveh. And there is a mosque there dedicated to the memory of Jonah. That is supposedly where Jonah is buried. And whether that's true or not, it's interesting that even Islam has a memorial to him and named the mosque after him. That's where that is. So Jonah is an interesting character celebrated in more than one world uh, faith, in, in fact. So uh, let's ask this question. Uh, Jonah, uh, those of us who know a little bit about him, I'll go into that now because we don't have the time. But again, turn to your friend and for a couple of minutes, in what way is Jesus greater than Jonah? Okay, in what way is Jesus greater than Jonah? Jonah. Um, well, both had a message of repentance, yeah. where Jesus delivered the message of repentance not only through words but also deeds by healing people first uh, before talking to them or bringing the message to them. So before before you can give a message, you, there needs to be healing first. Jonah also had the, the message of repentance, but he ran away from it. He did, he did go back, yeah. but he ran away from it. He did, in fact, he did. God, God, God got his attention. <laughs> That's right. But in the storm, Jonah was lost. Jesus has to prove by the storm. Come. Alright, Jonah ended up being chucked into the storm. Jesus had the power over the storm. Excellent point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonah wanted retribution and revenge. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sat down waiting for the, the end to come. And was, uh, Jesus wanted uh, revenge and so, uh, love. Jonah actually wanted the Ninevites to be um, wiped out. Yeah. I mean, they were the enemies. I mean, they were the ones who invaded and, and, and were causing great problems. So Jesus considered us as, although his enemies, he loved them. And completely different opposite. Yeah, okay. Any others? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Jesus was a fisher of men. Now, Simon the <laughs> fish food, fish I think that's the beginning of a children's story. I can see that children's story now, that Bible story. Excellent. Yes, Barry. Jesus was obedient to God and Jonah was not. Even though Jonah eventually was, it was against his better judgment and against his will. Whereas with Jesus, it was a willing. Jesus is more compassionate and more patient. Oh, yeah. Not even close, are they? Between it. Even though Jonah is held up as a paragon of, of prophecy in many ways, right? He's, he's a hero in Judaism, as well as Solomon. They're both heroes. And they are in many ways. But yet Jesus is so much beyond these two figures. And for the sake of time, you know, we don't the point that the passage here is not about Jonah and Solomon specifically, but we have to understand it about them to understand what Jesus is trying to get across in what he's saying to the people. Around here. Let me wrap up with a couple of thoughts and a couple of suggestions. Some things for us to think about. In both of these examples, with Solomon and with Jonah, Jesus uses the example of Gentiles, non believers, non Jews, not God fearers. He holds them up as a positive example, as against the people he's speaking to who are Jewish, who are people of the faith, and who might be expected to recognize and welcome the Messiah and his message. He holds up the Gentiles as an example, positive example, to contrast with the people around him who are a negative example. This tells us something about familiarity. That perhaps we need to be careful about familiarity with God's Word. Do we pick it up and we, do we really treasure it? Do we really listen to it? Because the instruction that Jesus is trying to emphasize here is listening. Listening and obedience, I think. Do we really listen? These people listened and repented. And the repentance is... We can talk a lot about that, but I think it's, in other words, it's obedience. Listening and obedience. Something that's commended in the passage not long before this, when the woman said to Jesus, blessed is the mother who gave you birth, and, she, and he says, blessed are those who hear and obey. 
So it's still a listening and obedience point. Jesus is, getting, is, 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 a, is a thread through the whole of, of Luke 11, really. And so the danger for some of us might be, I changed my life 10 years ago. I repented 10 years ago, or whatever it was. And that's been done. But Jesus, I think, would come and say, repentance is a lifestyle. Repentance is an attitude. Repentance is something that happens when we truly listen to God, rather than just hear some words. Are we really listening to the message? Jonah's here as the Ninevites, the enemies of Israel, listened and repented. Uh, the Queen of the South, not no, no Israelite, no Jewish faith, uh, took a year out of her life to come and listen to the wisdom of Solomon. What efforts are we making? Are we truly listening? We never, a Christian is never over repenting. That's not something we were done with. Um, a change of thinking. The refreshment can come. I mean, it's of the promise, Acts 3.19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. But times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. <coughs> the Ninevites were blessed by listening to Jonah. The Queen of the South was surely uh, helped by what she heard of the wisdom from Solomon. How much more we can be refreshed if we listen and repent. And if we don't want to know really what it means to repent, and we think of it as negative, then clearly we don't understand it, because repentance brings refreshment. Mm -hmm. So if we don't know it and understand it, then it's something to look into in the Bible to make sure we understand it. So, if we're not clear on how great Jesus is, we're not really clear on that, then it's important that we spend the time in the Bible to find out why. He really is the greatest. If we believe he's the greatest, I think it's really important that we make our get our hearts as soft as we can to make sure that we really listen to God's word. And if necessary, listen to what we need to repent of. Perhaps there is something that God's been nagging at you in your conscience or somewhere deep in your spirit about change. Repentance is simply change. The change of heart and mind leading to a change of action. Is there something that God's been perhaps trying to <coughs> catch your attention with in the same way he did for Jonah and the Ninevites, the Queen of the South and Solomon, and then Jesus in his day? Got some tips, some thoughts, three R's that might help us with this. To really listen. I think the third is the first is to read the Bible, and I would suggest we, we, we read, read it out loud. There's something very different about hearing the message of something. If we read it out loud and we read it slowly. In some traditions this is called Lectio Divina, which means just reading. Reading it under the conscious knowledge that God is with you and reading it slow. When's the last time you took a passage from the Bible and read it? As the crowds increased, Jesus said, slowly. Read it slowly. Read it in that way out loud. And I think we'll find that we'll be able to hear his message better. The second is to reflect. And that means taking some time out to be in silence, or at least as close to silence as we can get. Perhaps some noise cancelling headphones if you, if you can't figure out a place of quiet. But it's very hard to reflect what we and listen if we've got a lot of other noise going around. I know we've got noisy lives, that's the way it often is. But can you find a space, a place, a spot, um, some headphones that will help you? To, to read and then really think. And the third is, well, is to repent, is to go, and what I mean by that is to go into our reading of the Bible, our study of it, our reading of it, with the attitude of, I want to find something. God, what are you teaching me? And then what's my, what's the action that's called for here? Read and reflect and then repent. Ultimately, I think what Jesus is saying to his audience here in Luke 11 is, please take me seriously. You took Jonah seriously, you, took, you take Solomon seriously, and really, it's not hard to figure out I'm greater than them. And please take me seriously, even though it might cause you a little, to be a little bit uncomfortable at times. There's no doubt that Jesus is the greatest. No one lived like him. No one spoke like him. No one talked like him. No one healed like him. And no one died for his enemies like him. And rose from the dead to live a new life and give us that promise to look forward to as well. I hope these thoughts have been helpful. Let's make sure we listen and repent when we need to. Amen. Awesome.